So good morning, everyone. We have um, the plenary session now, and first speaker is Mike Sumner, who will introduce us to the stuff that he will do in his afternoons. Was it morning? morning. You have a morning session. In the morning session of, uh, of 11 o'clock. So um, this morning I'm giving a workshop on creating R packages. But we changed that because I think it's easier and more interesting for people than what I was going to do, which was about building our, our toolkit. Um, I think building our toolkit is interesting because the way we operate has been very valuable and very efficient and, and, and interesting for us. Um, And I'm just going to show you the toolkit that we have. And that's kind of motivation for why you create our packages. Um, and this is primarily a toolkit that we, we only use within our institute. Um, but we've worked to make it usable outside of that. Um, and didn't set this up, so. So first of all, one of the things we're very motivated by in ecosystem modeling in the Southern Ocean is, is animal tracking. And so one of the animals we study is, is elephant seals. And so they have these kind of remote um, populations on sub-Antarctic islands and in Antarctica, and they swim for thousands of kilometres across the ocean. So, so simple oceanographic variables like sea surface temperature and ice concentration densities are, are of deep interest for why are these animals going where they are. Um, and we track them with light level techniques, with geolocation, um, with Argos satellite triangulation, and, and, and more and more now with GPS. Um, but what that looks like, so it's not so abstract, is so I just have an inbuilt data set that is called Mirunga Leonina, and I'll call that seal. So It's a data frame in R. It has an ID for each tagged individual. It has a date time, a location quality class from the service we use to track it, and a longitude latitude estimate of where it was. And if I look at the world in the wrong way, with the simplest kind of plot. You can see that it's a significant area that these animals visit. So there's really big regions. Um, and from a very small island, from Heard Island in, this, in the Indian Ocean, two animals made very different choices about where to go to forage. And they, we know they're foraging because it takes time to exist, like time is energy. They swim very quickly to the, to the coast and they spend a lot of time down there. And that's, that's really probably where they're foraging. But lots of these animals make really other complicated decisions about where to go. Um, and that's one of the things that the people I work with are trying to figure out is why do they go where they go and how do they know? And this is, this is, this is not wrong just in plat Caray terms. It's, it's wrong because there's no three, third dimension. So this is thousands of kilometres, maybe 1,500, but, but they are diving to one or two kilometres down and c continuously. So if you think this is where they're going in, in geography, in, in, in reality they're, they're constantly going up and down and that's how they live. Um, but one of the things we might want to do is find out what what is the temperature of the surface of the water where they are? And what is the sea ice concentration? And it's complicated because, because
because of that. Every single position has to look up a different bit of raster data or a bit of remote sensing or a bit of a model. And so we created a thing called RAD tools or R-A-A-D tools and that means R Australian Antarctic Division tools. But it's, it's not just about the Antarctic Division. And the kinds of interfaces we have in there are functions called read ice, read SST, and there's a whole lot of them. So help. How does that work? Library equals red tools. What's the argument? I'll just use the index. Read ice. So each one of these functions is a function of date, and that's all you really need to know to use it. But you can also give it an XY limb so it'll read out the bit you want. And we have a lot of functions. So the, 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 we have read currents, read chlorophyll. That's too small, but... Um, we have a couple of dozen functions there that read really common remote sensing variables as a function of date. Um, and not because that's easy, it's because we built a data library with all those files in it and we keep it up to date every day. Um, and that part of RAD tools has become a thing called Bowbird, which is an R open sci project. And that sounds, fu it sounds funny, like keep a collection of, of data sources. It sounds very abstract. But for us, it's, it's like, how do I get that SST data? How do I get ICE data? How do I record what I learned about reading that data so that I can just use it? Um, and using Bowbird as a, as a way of aggregating data so that you can then put your tools on it is really what I was thinking of talking about. But I'm going to talk about our packages generally. Um, these functions are interesting because they'll give you a raster, so it understands that it's in a funny projection. So this one's in polar stereographic. This one's defaulting to the first day we have, which is 1978, October. If I ask it for a different date or for a more recent one, That works, and there's thing you know. I happen to know that this is a daily data set, so I know that I know the kind of query I'm asking. This is 2001. It's it's pretty low resolution data, um, but I can also just say latest equals true, and find out what is the latest. So it's the 3rd of September, which is a few days ago, and Bowbird is making that work for me. Um, if I plot that, and I'll get an SST one as well, but this time I'll do x, y, lim equals range, sealed all along. Range, sealed all that, so that I restrict it to where the, the data about the seal is. Plot, SST. And this one's a different grid. You know, it's, this one happens to be a quarter of a degree. It's in longitude, latitude. But it's the same, it's the same area. It's where the seals went. Um, line, seal, dog. So we can hone in quickly on, on what the animal's seeing from an environmental perspective. Um, if I read ice, it's harder. Like I have to know ex in expert terms that this is a polar stereographic grid. And if I want to match up where the seal was. Oh, God. So it's the same region. 
but it's, it's here in the pole view. And I, I have to know how to transform the, the, lat the long lats of the seal data into that. And so I... Um, GDAR project, C bind, long lat, the projection of the ice. And that'll make the right plot, you know. And, and the interesting thing you learn about this data set is the the grid data itself stops about here, so we don't necessarily are able to look it up for a particular thing. But where the animals are doing their interesting behaviour, we have data about the ice concentration, and that's really significant, yeah. But I haven't done anything with time, right? So these seals were there in 2013, over several months. And if I want to find out what the ice concentration or the SST is, I've got to go and download all the files and, and then figure out the mapping between the coordinates and the grid. And I've got to figure out the mapping between the time of the seal track and the time of the file. But because we have all the files, and I have a function for each of this, which is ice files, I've already got a kind of a map of what's available. So I have the day, date, time of what the file is. I have a link on our, on our file system to, the, to that exact file. Um, these ones are in binary format. So they don't have a format. You've just got to read them with raw tools and then turn them into geographic information. Um, but because I have all that kind of indexed and, and sorted, then I can do abstractions like what is the temperature of the water at the surface where the seal was? So seal dollar SST. And I extract on a function read SST. Because I can go and read the corner of the globe that the seal visited. I know how to do that, but I can just make a function to do that for the times. And I need to tell it seal. Uh, long, lat, and I've forgotten what the column's called. Long lat date. And an extract method for a function in RAD tools just simply knows to go and find which file matches that day and find the, the SST for it for any seal location that we have. And, you know, it takes a bit of time and some data sets are faster than others, but when I have a lot of seals and a lot of data to work with, I can just go and let that job happen. And the interface is longitude latitude. So if the if the grid's in another projection, the function just turns that into the projection of the grid and looks it up. Yeah, I found that very odd. You know, when I thought of it, it's like, that's really odd. But the, f the function knows about the data. I, I, I made the function know about the data, about the format. I don't want to think about it anymore. It's just odd that you have a method this based on the class function. Yeah, I can't, I can't see a better way to do it. A better way to do it would be to have an SST object that's free-floating and just keeps updating. Yeah, and that's, that's what you're doing. We'll do that. It's taking longer than I wanted, but I'm going to show the time series as a final plot, and then I'm finished. It's too slow.
And, you know, it's, it's right. That's, that's a spurious warning. I have to be careful with vector fields. So we have, we have surface currents, and they, they inherently come in U and V components, so you have to do those separately just because of raster problems, but stars will fix that. I have a read ice function, so I just stick it in there. Just the usual kind of mistake. This one's faster, because each file's tiny, like it's about half a megabyte, and we just read it in raw binary. And the point of that is that now I have a very different view of the seal, the seal experience. So rather than plotting a map, if I plot a time series of its longitude, it's clear that you know each seal, one went west and one went east. And if I look at latitude, but they both you know returned to the same place. You know, in latitude they're very similar. They both went to the edge of the ice. But I've also put on the ice concentration. And so we can see that when they started, they, there was zero ice at all. But as they went south, it got thicker and thicker. And the same with temperature. You know, it's about six degrees at Heard Island at the surface, and then it's, a, it's, it's less than zero because it's salt and water when they get to the, the coast. Anyway, thank you. That's it. Good morning. So my name is Judith. I work here at the Institute for Geoinformatics since three years. And um, the group that I lead is called Geosimulation Modeling. And this afternoon, I will teach a tutorial on dynamic modeling with PC raster Python. First, I will shortly introduce the terminology, because you might not have heard before of the word geosimulation modeling, and you might wonder what is the difference between dynamic modeling and geosimulation modeling. After that, I will show you two examples of my research, one of an agent-based model and one of a field-based model, and at the very end, I introduce the tutorial that I will teach this afternoon. So, I start here with this overview overview of basically the two sides of dynamic modeling that you could, could see, basically. Most of the modeling that you have done so far in this summer school is data-driven modeling. So that means you have a data set, that data set represents your system state, so the variable that you want to model, and based on that system state, and a set of explanatory variables, you try to build a model. The other side of the spectrum of dynamic modeling is basically that you start with a theory. So you have a certain system, and you have a theory about how that system functions. So what are the entities in that system? How do they interact with each other? So that we call theory-driven modeling. That means, so you start with a theory, a system description, and you implement that. So you don't use any data for that yet. That theory-driven modeling is the type of modeling that I do. And there are several terms for it. You might be familiar with the term process-based modeling. It's the term that they usually use in the natural science domain, so in hydrology, in meteorology. You have knowledge about your system, so about hydrology, for example. You know when rainfall falls onto the ground, how does it work, that part infiltrates and part uh, flows off, and that you implement. 
Um, the, the term geosimulation modeling is the same thing, but it's used more in a social science domain. Um, you can also see data-driven modeling as top-down modeling and theory-driven mo modeling as bottom-up. Let me explain that. So with data-driven modeling, you start with your system state and from that you derive what the processes are. So you start looking top-down at your system state. The system state is, for example, in the hydrological model, um, the, uh, the flow in the river. You can do it the other way around. You start implementing the elements in your system and how they interact. And then what comes from that is your system state. So that's why we call that bottom-up modeling. Um, yeah. So here you see an example of a geosimulation model. And it is of a city system. This is the city of Madrid, and the model predicts or projects where this city is expanding over time. It starts in 92, and it goes until 2012, I think. In black, you see urban cells. In white, you see non-urban cells. And the model that is behind this is a probabilistic model. That means it doesn't say deterministically this cell becomes urban or it does not, but it gives a probability that a certain cell becomes urban over time. That is why at the beginning, the initial map, you see only black and white, but over time, when the model is projecting, you see red colors appearing, meaning that there's some uncertainty whether at that point in time there will be urban or not. So here I come to a definition of geosimulation modeling. So first you need to understand what I mean with a system. A system is any set of interacting entities that form one integrated whole. It's not necessarily a closed system, but at least something that, is, that you can understand as a whole. So in the example of hydrology, your system is usually one river basin. That doesn't mean that there are no interaction from outside, but most of the interaction between the entities takes place inside that system. Then what I mean with a model is a purposeful and simplified representation of that real world system. So my model is in the computer, the system is what I observe outside. <laughs> and it is purposefully simplified. With that I mean, when you build a model, you always have a purpose in mind. And that purpose determines how you simplify your system. When you have the purpose, for example, to predict the river flow, uh, that makes you take certain choices about which elements to include and which elements to exclude. When you are more interested in soil moisture, you might make different choices about what's elements to include and exclude. And then finally, we come to a geosimulation model that is a spatially explicit, process-based dynamic model. And this type of dynamic modeling is what I'm going to show this afternoon in the tutorial. A conceptually, model looks like this. A geosimulation model. We have inputs, I, for every point in time. Then, here in the middle, we have f. f is the transition function that explains how my inputs come to my system state. So we go from inputs to system state, and this function typically has some parameters, p. And then we have here our system state at a certain point in time. That system state is also input for the next point in time. So we have a kind of Markov chain process, if you're familiar with that term. In geosimulation modeling, we distinguish two different paradigms. And these paradigms will be very easy to understand for you, because you already understand the difference between vector and raster. This difference is kind of similar. So we have agent-based modeling. And in agent-based modeling, we model a set of discrete entities that we call agents. All attributes that you model are linked to this agent. 
So agents can be people, for example, and these people have an age. The age is always linked to the agent. Yeah. Uh, the processes that you implement in this system, they, are, they represent the behavior of a single agent. So the people, they walk or they talk to each other. This kind of process is what you implement. On the other hand, you have field-based modeling, and in field-based modeling, the system state is uh, continuous or discrete, but at least every uh, attribute has a value everywhere. So if you model H in a field-based model, then every raster cell has an H. And the behavior that you implement is evaluated per grid cell. So per grid cell, uh, this age is changing somehow. So these are two very different approaches, and of course, wh which one you choose depends on the type of system that you want to model, and you can also combine them. I will give one example of my research of each of these two modeling paradigms now. The first example is about agent-based modeling of pedestrian behavior. Here you see an agent-based model of students on a campus. Um, the reason that we started this project is that my PhD student and me, um, we were of the opinion that the current pedestrian uh, models, they are quite simplistic. They assume that if a certain pedestrian has an origin and a destination, it just always takes the shortest path, most of these models. And I think in reality that's not really the case that we take the shortest path. Depends on what we want to do, maybe we take the path that is the most beautiful, that goes through a park or so, or if we need to do some shopping along the way, we go through the commercial district. And if we don't know the area that well, then we might choose the path that is the easiest to remember, but typically we don't take the shortest path. Um, also, this type of models um, assumes that the agents have a perfect map in their mind, also not very realistic, and that the streets are the only geographic elements that they have in mind. That's also not realistic because when we navigate, we remember buildings or trees or parks. We don't just look at cities when we navigate, at streets when we navigate. So the project is about making this type of models a bit more realistic. Um, what we do here is we try to make a new set of pedestrian models that is based on the theory of Lynch. Lynch is an American scholar uh, from the 60s and he pioneered the um, yeah, research of uh, spatial cognition of cities. And his theory is that people perceive a city in five different types of elements. Paths, nodes, landmarks, districts, and edges. And here you see an example of how we use his theory about districts in the model. So, in the previous example, you saw that um, every agent selects an origin destination and then formulates a path directly. Now what we implemented is that first the agent thinks, okay, what is the district that I have to navigate through? So first you think, ah, okay, I have to go from here to here, that means I will cross this and this neighborhood. So first you think at a more global level and then you go locally formulating this intra-region path. So we select first the yellow and blue region and then we formulate the path. Now in the agent-based model we compared these two approaches and here you see the result. On the left-hand side uh, the agents take the angular change shortest path. I'm not going to explain what it is but it's kind of one type of a shortest path algorithm. And on the right-hand side we use our routing a regional routing algorithm. What you can see here is that on the left-hand side, most agents take the same streets 
and on the right hand side there's a bit more variation between the routes that the different agents take. At this point in time, I cannot say which of the two is more realistic because the validation is what we're working on at the moment. Then the second example that I want to present you is an example of a field-based geosimulation model, and it is one of land use change. In this land use change model, I simulate uh, Brazil. This was the research that I did as a PhD student. And as a PhD student, I worked in an energy science group. And that energy science group was interested in the impacts of uh, biofuel production. In Brazil, they cultivate sugarcane, and from sugarcane, they make biofuels, bioethanol more specifically. So ethanol that you can use to put in your car. Now the discussion there is that biofuel is supposed to be sustainable, but if you have to cultivate this sugar cane in a place where there was forest before, then it might not be so sustainable because you get, get a lot of greenhouse gas emissions from this land use change. And in practice, it's not that simple because usually the sugar cane is not placed on a place where there was forest before, but you have a kind of cascading effect. So the sugar cane replaces um, land that was cropland before. The cropland is displaced to where there was pasture before, and the pasture is displaced into the forest. And because you have this cascading effect, you cannot directly observe the effect of the biofuels with remote sensing, because you will never see, or you will see very few places where there was sugar cane placed on top of forest. There was this cascading effect, but when you see that pasture displaces forest, you cannot distinguish whether that is because of the biofuels or because of something else. And for that reason, I use a land use change model because then we can run two scenarios, one without additional demand for biofuels and one with, and then we can compare the changes across both scenarios and thereby we can isolate the effect of the biofuels. So that's the idea here. And for that, we coupled three different models. One is an economic model, a global economic model, uh, that predicts basically the demand of every feedstock. And then we have the land use change model that takes an input from this economic model and determines where in Brazil the land use is going to change with this increased demands. Then finally, we have a carbon module that computes after the land use has changed how much carbon emission or how much carbon sequestration that results in. Um, the land use change model is actually implemented in PC Raster Python, so that is the software you're going to work with this afternoon. And it works like this, that for every land use type, it calculates drivers of location, and based on that, it makes a suitability map. And on places with the highest suitability, it starts allocating until the demand for that land use type is fulfilled. Again, this model is stochastic. So on the right hand side, you see a picture of the probability that there is sugar cane for biofuels in 2030. So in red, you see cells with a high probability that sugar cane is expanding there, and in uh, white, pink, low probabilities. Mm. What is interesting now is, so you saw here that we have two different models, and both these models have some uncertainty in their inputs and parameters. Now I did a sensitivity analysis by turning the uncertainty in one model on and off to determine which of these two models causes the most uncertainty in this final result. So here you see when we have only the uncertainty from the economic model, then the patches that are uncertain, or the grid cells that are uncertain, are mostly at the edge 
of one patch. Why is that? Because the economic model determines how much demand there is. So in one run there may be this much demand and in another run a bit more. So that makes this patch a bit larger or a bit smaller. The land use change, on the other hand, determines where the land use is going to expand. So when we turn only the uncertainty in the land use model on, you see that you just get different shapes of patches of expansion. So that is the type of research that I do with these models. And then here on the left-hand side, you see the result of the carbon model. Uh, we run one uh, business as usual scenario and five different scenarios implementing measures try to limit the land use change and the greenhouse gas emissions. And you see here that we can select which mitigation measure has the highest effect on greenhouse gas emissions. In this case, it was this particular scenario. So my tutorial this afternoon is about PC Raster Python. PC Raster has existed for a very long time, since the 90s, and it's software with which you can do map algebra and spatiotemporal modeling. Before, it worked as a standalone language called PCR Calc, but since 10 years there's also a Python library, and that's very convenient because then we can use other Python libraries to do um, our analysis. And there is the PC Raster Python framework. This is a set of three different frameworks uh, that help you to very easily construct models. There's one dynamic modeling framework. This is the one I will teach this afternoon uh, that helps you to just build a dynamic model very quickly. And then there is a stochastic modeling framework with which you can build models, as I showed before, so models that have uncertainty in them, and the stochastic framework takes care of the Monte Carlo analysis for you. And then there's a data simulation framework with which you can ba do Bayesian data simulation. Um, yeah. So you see here uh, the visualization kit of PC Raster called Agila. It doesn't look very fancy, but you mainly use it to quickly visualize your results. But the map format of uh, PC Raster is also available in GDAL. So usually when you are happy with your results, you transform them into another format uh, for the figures that you have in your report or on your website. So what are we going to model this afternoon? We're going to build a model of fire spread. It will not look as fancy as the one here, but I show this one as a kind of teaser. So fire spread means that we initiate a fire somewhere and the model will predict how it will spread over time. I taught the same model to my students here at the university, and after that they did a study project to implement the FIRE model, not simply on their computer in a 2D map, but in the sandbox. You might have seen a sandbox before. It's simply a box of sand with a Kinect above it. The Kinect senses the topography of the sand, sends it to a computer. The computer builds a digital elevation model. And then a projector projects this digital elevation model. But of course, you can also use the elevation model to do computations. And in this case, the elevation model is used as an input for the fire spread model. So the fire spreads faster uphill. And yeah, you can visualize the model on top of the digital elevation model. Mm. Yeah, so this is what we will do. Uh, one thing important to mention is please try to install the software before you come to the tutorial. Installing PC Raster Python is not as straightforward as installing an R package. It requires like four or five steps. And if I have to install it for all 30 people in the tutorial, that will cost me two hours and we have no time to do the actual exercises. So please do it before. And if you have problems, you can come to my office in one for one and I will help you. Yeah, any short questions at this point? No, thanks. Okay, thanks. 
Okay, now this should all work. Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Um, yeah, so uh, my talk is called uh, How the OpenEO Project Unifies Access to Big Earth Observation Data Processing Platforms. And um, I will come to what that means in a second. Um, yeah, as, as I said, I'm, I'm Christoph, um, that is him himself, and uh, this is Matthias Moore, who is uh, working on this project um, full-time uh, in the Institute. Um, and is doing uh, lots of the core work. Um, the idea of OpenEO is uh, to develop an open API that connects various clients to big Earth observation cloud backends in a simple and unified way. Um, so um, it, it's about various clients and various backends, and the idea is to make the connection between them uh, standardized and as easy as possible. When you say we are doing that, um, I mean uh, the OpenEO Consortium, which consists uh, not only of the University of Münster, but also the Universities of Wageningen and Wien, Vienna. Um, and there are a couple of other research institutions from several countries in Europe involved. And uh, this is all funded by the European Union's H2020 program. Um, why do we do this? Um, Earth observation data has become too large to download in the last couple of years. And even if you were able to download it, it would be just too big to handle it on your little laptop. So you need more advanced computational capacities. Um, so that's the reason why Earth observation processing solutions are increasingly becoming more cloud-based. Um, and these cloud-based solutions pop up like mushrooms. So um, there's the DSS from the uh, Copernicus program. There are the thematic exploitation platforms by ESA. There's Google Earth Engine. There's Sentinel Hub. Um, Geo Trellis Rasterman, just to name a few. And um, yeah, so there's, there's lots of them. And uh, the analogy to um, describe the motivation of OpenEO that I've been told uh, has to do with GDAL. So um, may I ask who of you knows GDAL? Please raise your hand. Yeah, that's what I assumed, pretty much everyone. Uh, do you know the time before there was GDAL? It's uh, <laughs> Michael Duva. Well, I don't because that was way before I was born. But anyway, I've been told that in the, back in the days, um, each um, GIS system had its own database, and only that system itself was possible to talk to that database because it was all proprietary and um, no interconnection existed. Um, then, uh, maybe a decade later, uh, file formats were introduced, so um, like the shapefile of, Ar of ArcInfo or GeoTIFF, and different um, uh, GISs could access different file formats depending on whether it was implemented for them or not, et cetera, et cetera. And then there was GDAL, um, who introduced that abstraction layer um, so that any of um, those GIS could just implement GDAL, and then through that you could access all of them, and that made things a whole lot easier. So when you look at the um, Earth observation cloud backend landscape these days, um, it's pretty much like this. So there are different backends, and each of them has their own database where it has their data and does their processing. And I think it becomes quite obvious from this that if I go back a couple of slides, that looks pretty much like that. And so open your thought, why don't we just skip this mess and just do it right in the first place? So um, from this, we would like to go to that. So that all the backends have that one abstraction layer, open your API in the middle, and can be accessed by different clients. We, and the ones we cater for at the moment are R, Python, and the JavaScript library for web stuff or Node or whatever. So then. Of course, um, this uh, situation where each of the clients has to talk each language, which is indicated by the colors here, becomes a situation like here on the right-hand side, where there's just one language needed so that every client can talk directly to any backend. Um, why do we do this? I said these points before. Um, another point that um, um, 
yeah, is to combine different backends into um, yeah, one workflow or process. Um, so if uh, different backends have different things on offer that you would need, um, having that one common language makes it a lot easier to um, combine that into, um, into your workflow. Um, extensibility, so that you can um, uh, yeah, teach a backend um, your way of doing things. I will come to what we mean with that later. Um, and one important thing is to compare or validate the results that backends export. Um, so you could, if you have a common language, you can run one um, analysis on one backend and then rerun it on a different backend. And if they produce the same result, then you've reproduced this result by a different method. And that's the thing science is all about, really. Um, and this can help to build trust in uh, the workflows scientists do and in the results they come up with. And so far, from all these backends that are listed up here, um, Google Earth Engine really is maybe the only feasible offering that there is um, in terms of being easy to use and being available now. So um, some say that Google Earth Engine is the only place where one can get things done at the moment easily. And um, what happens if this is still the case five years from now? Um, the problem is that Google Earth Engine is not open, so you can't see what is inside, and you rely on Google running it and running it for free for you. And uh, if there was an open source solution uh, by the community, that would help things a lot. Um, and we think that uh, this common interface between um, uh, backends can indeed help uh, upcoming backends to um, or service providers to um, yeah, gain momentum and ease the transition between the existing Google Earth Engine workflows and maybe newly more open options. So how would you do all that? So what we are doing is we define um, a core API um, uh, that should so, so uh, design the language that should be used uh, between the backends and the clients. Um, we do this in a, in a RESTful API with uh, JSON bindings, which is the state of the art at the moment. Um, and uh, we implement reference implementations for that. So we've got the free clients libraries I mentioned for R, Python, and JavaScript. And we build drivers for seven backends. So we build a piece of software that translates the OpenEO code into the code the backends understands. And really this implementing thing is uh, what OpenEO is uh, about. So we not only uh, come up with a theoretical idea, but we actually do it practically because having running software available is what gets things done. And um, that's why we put in yeah, the main focus on that. Um, we also um, define a process catalog um, with uh, processes that should be available on backends or could be available um, from stuff like minimum, maximum to um, band math to um, more complex things like uh, computing and NDVI or stuff like that. And everything we do is open source. You, so if you go to GitHub, uh, you, can, you can download all the stuff we do there and use it for free. Um, let me show you um, a little live demonstration um, of uh, the things we've got there. So um, I will, oh, uh, you can't see that yet. Um, there we go. So um, that is the starting page of OpenEO Hub, which is uh, the piece of software I constructed within this project. So. Um, I work as a student assistant, and that was pretty much my bachelor thesis. Um, so what this hub does, it uh, nightly, it, it crawls all the backends that there are at the moment and collects the information uh, about what they offer uh, so that someone who's interested generally in OpenEO can have a look at what is available, what can I do. Um, so there's uh, six backends here in here at the moment. Um, 
And I will show you the Google Earth engine one because that's the driver that is most complete at the moment. Um, as, uh, as a project, we are still work in progress. So um, there's a little uh, description here, and then um, the hub displays uh, which functionalities of the API are supported by this backend. So which authentication methods are available, whether you can uh, estimate the processing costs that a certain query would cost you, um, because we only also cater for um, paid services, because otherwise these paid services may not have an interest to support OpenYO. Um, yeah, whether you can store your own files there and work with them, um, validating user-defined functions is um, about uploading your own R or Python scripts and including those into a workflow. Um, and well, not all, not all backend support everything, so that's what this hub is for to get an over, overview. Um, you can list all the collections that, um, or data sets that the backend offers. So, um, for example, here you've got an uh, Australian five meter digital elevation model that is within um, uh, Google Earth Engine. And you've got the uh, spatial extent that is covered, so it's about Australia. Um, and uh, so you can get an overview of which data you can work with. You can also get an overview about the processes that are available, because not all processes have to implement all processes of a process catalog. Um, but here you can see uh, what does add dimension do, and see all the parameter things, and this is intended to make um, developing uh, open your process graphs um, more easy. This process graph is the core thing within the open your project speech, so that defines um, uh, a workflow from um, yeah, getting uh, the data to uh, analyzing it to outputting it, um, and I will show you one process graph in a minute. Um, but before we do that, um, yeah, you can also see which uh, output forms are available and which um, service types are available, maybe to see, um, uh, so for example, service types means something like WMS, um, and uh, this, this client here, for example, uh, offers 82 output formats, I think because they've got some GDAL thing running in the back end. Um, yeah. Billing information, as I said, catering for the um, paid services as well. Um, but uh, yeah, I promise you to show you a process graph, so I will open this backend in the OpenUO web editor um, and log in. So that's um, a, Java, a web app interface that uses that JavaScript client API to talk to the backends, and we implemented that so that anyone can just uh, yeah, play around with, with a backend, and especially also to make um, uh, development easier because uh, in here you can now search for for collections so I will just enter s2 for sentinel 2 and then I can just drag and drop this data set over here and start doing things with it like for example um, filtering it um, by a polygon um, so when I have both of these in here um, I can draw an arrow from here to there to the data and um, uh, for example, um, select uh, uh, the bands that uh, I would uh, want to have here, like uh, like like rain, for example, or select uh, only one time interval that should be uh, included in here. Um, yes. But I, I won't click together one now because that would take a bit too long. Um, I have saved a process graph down here that um, calculates uh, the minimum NDVI for um, yeah, pretty much if you want for the whole world. Um, so that uses the uh, Copernicus Sentinel-2 imagery, um, runs a normalized difference process on that, um, reduces that to, uh, to the minimum in the temporal dimension, 
and then applies a linear scale range so that um, the output is mapped to 0 to 255 so that you can see it as pixel intensities and then uh, saves that as a PNG. And um, I can now just uh, click here and now this process graph is um, sent to the Google Earth Engine driver which is running on an Institute server and that translates it to, um, to Google Earth Engine script and sends that script to the actual Google Earth Engine server somewhere in the United States probably. Where this script is processed, the uh, results are sent back to the driver which forwards it back to my computer here. And you can see now building that up. Um, it looks a bit dark on the, um, uh, on the um, with the beamer here, um, but if I make it a little bit transparent, maybe you can see that um, the NDVI uh, is, is less on the Ruhr area and, and along the Rhine area, um, the Rhine Valley here, and it's obviously um, yeah, bigger in the uh, Black Forest area, for example. Yeah. And in theory, I could um, just take this process graph and run it on a different backend as well, and I should get the same result. Um, yeah. Back to how this all works internally. Um, so we use existing standards where possible within our API. Um, uh, can I have that? Um, within our API. So as I said, it's, it's RESTful. We use uh, an open API document to describe it. This was previously known as Swagger. If you've, that's the more familiar term for you. You can output GeoJSON. We use OpenID Connect for authentication, um, all these little things. What we don't do, we don't use the web processing service standard. That is an OGC standard. Um, which seems like the most obvious re, uh, yeah, solution to solve this problem when uh, you read the, the, the title, but um, sadly it doesn't support chaining the process together like we, you just saw that in, in the process graph. So there you would have to um, run one piece of a process graph, store that, get it again, process that, and that would not be feasible for the big amount of data and the kind of processes uh, we've got in mind. Um, but there is a driver for um, WCPS uh, uh, services um, uh, so that you could um, access that, so that uh, such a driver uh, sits between the OpenEO API coming from the clients and the existing cloud backend here and um, this works without really touching the existing cloud backend, so you can just put that adapter in between when it works. Um, the uh, results that you get can be exposed via any web service like uh, WMS uh, or, or just a tile map server. Um, the whole API is compliant to the upcoming OGC API core API commons part. Um, and uh, we are very involved in developing STACK, which is a new metadata standard for data discovery and stands for Spatial Temporal Asset Catalog. Um, so that is uh, very helpful for us to, so that backends can describe the data sets they've got on offer. So what we had um, one year ago was these uh, three clients, seven backends, and they could um, run uh, process graphs for free use cases with a handful of processes and um, over the last year we've um, increased that a lot so uh, we completely reworked our process graph structure um, because we realized you couldn't really um, do parallelized processing with callbacks and stuff like that so the reducer like you saw uh, before would not have been possible this way um, now you can also uh, output multiple results. You can use process graph variables in case that uh, data collections have different names and different servers. You can insert variable for the actual name, um, things like that. Then, of course, we had to adapt all our client libraries and backend drivers to that new version, and we are still a little bit in the process of doing that, but 
more and more um, things uh, are done. Um, yeah, compatibility, I said that. And our process graph catalog now includes more than 100 processes, um, which uh, are very detailedly defined by Matthias. So we put a lot of work into um, selecting the processes that are needed and defining them in a way that they are not ambiguously uh, interpreted and um, in the hope that the backends implement them as detailedly as he uh, told that so that um, indeed this vision of having the same results on different backends uh, yeah, can become reality. And UDF is this uh, user-defined function that I mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, so we have reference implementations in R and Python for that so that you can if you find that the existing processes don't match what you need or you, you need more um, programming logic, you can take your existing R script or Python script and um, upload that to the server. The server runs it in their sandbox on their data so um, um, that your code comes close to the data and you don't have to send that data all around half the globe. Um, and yeah, that's a pretty big thing, maybe Etza could say more about how, how that has been done. Um, yeah, my lessons learned personally by uh, implementing that uh, Open Your Hub was that, um, well, you can specify things as clearly as possible, but the programmers don't really read the docs. They just think, oh, yeah, I think it was this and this way, I will just return this in my API, and then I try to crawl their stuff with my hub, and um, it all fails. <laughs> And uh, yeah, but we had very um, um, yeah, much feedback on that, and so I could help them to to, to sort their issues. Um, yeah, describing all those processes takes time. Matthias worked for weeks on on finishing that uh, process catalog, um, but in the end, standardizing these algorithms uh, and how they should work that is feasible. What is less feasible and more hard is to standardize the data. Um, the first thing is this non-uniform naming I mentioned before, that on one, one backend the same collection may be called Sentinel-2 and the others call it Copernicus S2 and the third one calls it a different name. But not only the naming is different, sometimes also the content is different. Um, for example, Google Earth Engine um, puts all the Sentinel-2 imagery into one huge thing. Um, but in doing so, it makes a few assumptions on, uh, for example, which, uh, which orbits you want and stuff like that. And if you're a more scientific user, you may want to have more uh, control over that. So um, this idea of taking the same process graph and running it somewhere else um, not only depends on um, the things uh, that are about the processes, but also about the data that is in the actual backends, and that's a bit that's uh, the issue that is a bit harder to, to tackle. Um, still to come, implementing, implementing all these processes of the process catalog in all the backends, uh, full compatibility to the newest API version and getting it all ready. Um, that are the things that are in the pipeline. Some challenges that are upcoming next to that uniform naming um, is incorporating everything into one API and not forgetting a use case that um, yeah, would make OpenEO not a feasible option for, for some within the domain. Um, but we dropped the idea of including everything, like uh, the payments for, um, um, for the paid, paid users, commercial users. Um, they've got to say, uh, yeah, work that out themselves. We're not going to include a huge payment API within OpenEO because it's really out of scope. Um, those user-defined functions are still being worked on. Um, efficient access to big data via the di data cube um, uh, uh, concept applied both to raster and vector data. Um, again, that's a thing uh, Etz is um, uh, um, yeah, working on and could t tell more about, so ask him if you want to know something about that. Um, validating the backends against each other, reproducibility, there was a master thesis. Um, that explored how things can be compared, because even if files are not identical, byte by byte, they may still um, yeah, have the, pretty much the same results. Um, 
and for the commercial providers, the cost estimates are um, more difficult to determine than we expected. So we expected that if we ask them what would this process graph cost if it would run on your backend, they can't really say it, uh, at least until now. Um, challenges for the project itself um, uh, are that we need users to adopt this, and not only clients, but uh, also the server. So we've got to convince backend providers to include OpenEO in their back, uh, in their infrastructure. We try to minimize their um, effort as much as possible by writing those drivers ourselves for them without them having the need to, to touch their system. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it's still a hard thing to do, and we can't do it for all of them. So there are certainly more backends out there than the ones we address. Um, but we can't solve it alone for everyone. So what we hope will happen is that this all um, becomes a community project in the end, um, like, uh, like, like GDAL became, um, and that this project sustains itself, because we've only got one more year to go, and then the project, well, as projects are, it's, it's meant to end. Um, we've got some big players on board, like Google Earth Engine or the uh, Sentinel Hub by Synergize. Um, so that's one thing that gives us hope that it will continue. Next to that, some of the consortium partners will actually use OpenEO in production on their systems, so they will have an interest to maintain it. And um, if uh, you as, as, as users, um, uh, we want to... Um, yeah, make open your uh, yeah, known to you as well, and that's why uh, yeah, we are on conferences, holding workshops and hackathons like this afternoon, where you can um, get your own hands on on open your own. And um, yeah, we hope that uh, you will like this new option you've got. So yeah, thanks for your attention, and let me know your questions if you've got any. to take right now or that does not seem to be the case well you will have the option to go to that uh, hackathon uh, this afternoon and get your hands on and maybe then they are also chat to, to me or Matthias um, yeah Um, the initial proposal has some uh, um, has some writes down some ideas about that and suggested names of people who would take care of that initially, but that is something I think we have to discuss during the third year, and it will also heavily depend on uh, those partners that will continue that will take this up in production. Yes, I think they will have a say in this. So that's, that's still rather open. Good question. <clears throat> uh, so the last uh, new session, so we have two sessions that are today that are repetitions of earlier that were presented earlier. Uh, the last session of today uh, is uh, mine, which is in our development session, so to speak, um, which is on, there's by the way, there is a bullet here. Christoph, is this yours? Oh, yes, it's mine. Good. Um, so, the, oh, sorry, yes, thank you. Um, so the uh, idea came up. So we have, we we can now sort of the the thing is how to handle spatial temporal data in uh, in R, and. Um, part of spatial temporal data is, is things that we, that we cover in uh, the STARS package, which is, which is essentially if you have like uh, time series of rasters, time series of satellite images, where the satellite images align, um, or 
time series for fixed stations where the stations don't move. Yeah, so these are essentially things where all the, all the spatial features have an identical repetition over time. Uh, and that's a rather uh, a very common case, uh, but also a very uh, special case, yeah? because they, they line up so you can, you can use arrays and so on, and, and indexing, and it's also pretty straightforward. Uh, an entirely different uh, class is the case where you have uh, movement data. That is where, where Anita uh, looks at. So if you have a sequence of fixes that, that belong together as a, as a trajectory. Uh, and um, the class that I was now looking at is, is kind of the more um, loosely or, or generic class where you have just, uh, let's say, some spatial description, so a point line or a polygon, and a timestamp. Yeah, so that, that could be, you know, if you group them and order them, that could be trajectories. But in principle, it could be any kind of events. Yeah? So events like uh, diseases, accidents, and so on. Um, uh, or even you could, you could encode any. You could also very inefficiently, of course, put your satellite image in, in that format. Uh, but it's, it's just not very, uh, very convenient. So it, it's essentially the, the unstructured spatiotemporal data um, you could use for that, you could use the SF uh, package. Yeah, there are, uh, there are examples um, where we have... Um, where we have um, the a data set here, which is, which is the North Carolina polygons, with a couple of variables. Here you see birth rates at 1974. Uh, disease rates 1974 and non-white non birth disease, non-white birth rates in 1974. So there are three columns associated to the 1974 time stamp or period, and three that are associated with the 1979. So we can, and, and then, so we have essentially time here in, in, in col distributed over columns, but that's not so, that, that's not really the, the case. So that's still uh, regular in the sense of we have the same uh, set of uh, time observations for each uh, feature. Uh, but other cases would be if you have irregular uh, times. Um, you could, of course, say, well, I'm going to add a time, a POSIX CT or a date column to, uh, to a data frame, uh, and then you have it, right? And the question, there's a, uh, there's a few questions to that. The question, if you write software that assumes spatial temporal data, how are you going to sort of find out which column is time? You can, look at the, you can look at the class, but what happens if there are two columns that, that are that, right? Or there are three columns or zero columns. So it, it makes sense to think about a structure uh, essentially or probably a subclass of, uh, of SF tables that document, besides documenting which column is the geometry column, uh, that documents which column is the time column. Yeah? So that would be step one. That sounds very trivial. Uh, but then a, a non-trivial thing is sort of what, what would be proper methods that then act not only on space but also act on time. How would an ST intersects work, for instance, if you, if you give it an object that is also spatiotemporal? Um, that is one question. Another question is how to deal with time intervals. Yeah, so time intervals. In time, if you look at time series data, the time interval is, is almost always entirely uh, implicit, right? You have a time series, and you look at the time stamps, and then you see that subsequent records sort of denote days or denote hours, but that the time stamp is really a, a, a time instance, and that the, inter, the information about time intervals is essentially the difference from one time step to the next that tells you, well, this is a time interval, and since I know what the variable is about, it's interval data, and, and this is associated with that time period rather than with a time stamp. Other things are time stamps, really, so that, that depends. Um, here's an example in the XDX package where they have um, a simple data set that is financial data that says open, high, low, close. So that is the, the prices of stocks um, at the uh, opening of the market day, at the closure of close of the market day. So that's two time instances and then has a highest value and the lowest value for that day. So that, those are two nonlinear aggregates over the entire day. Yeah? So this is, this is uh, volatility uh, summarized over, for, uh, over a day. 
uh, and, and that's, that's very... So since in space we are very aware of, uh, of, of support, of, of right sort of whether something is associated with a point or a line or a polygon, we sh I think we should also do that with time. And also the, the effect that you have subsequent records, as you see here, subsequent records, where it's pretty clear what the time interval is and what the record for time interval is. If you put space to it, you don't have that because you have sort of multiple spatial things. So you, a time instance is not, not simply associated with a single spatial entity. So, this doesn't, so that, that kind of simple concept uh, doesn't work anymore. And then you may want to ha think about how to represent time intervals. And if you do that, you may want to think about sort of the Allen's time, uh, the, the Allen, uh, Allen's uh, interval um, uh, algebra that, that also Veronica uh, mentioned earlier is implemented in the uh, time grass extensions uh, and, and sort of the logic or the predicates that you can, can do with them. So time has a couple of very nice properties. Uh, the main one is that it's directed, yeah, so that we can, for instance, work with half open intervals so that two intervals that actually meet, that they don't intersect, yeah, because they don't have a point in common, because one of the intervals is, is, uh, is, is uh, right open and the other one is left closed. So, there, so all the time is covered, but, but there's no overlap, no, there's no common points in common. Um, so those are the things that I want to, and that is one, so time intervals is one thing, and that is essentially what you would say, this is the line or polygon equivalence of, of time. Um, but the other one is sort of the multi-line or multi-polygon is that you could, ha you could think about uh, multiple time intervals. Yeah? If you think something like uh, this is the feature, this is the shop, and these are the opening hours of the shop. Yeah? You have a, a sequence of time intervals. Um, so that is something else that you could, could think about whether that should be represented or not. If you're anyway going to the interval way, why not do multiple intervals? Uh, so there are, those are thoughts that I want to sort of bring up and discuss and, and, and sort of maybe come to a draft uh, implementation for that. <coughs> um, so that's going to happen this morning. Uh, now I wanted to sort of do a check uh, on who is going where and um, who is going to report at the plenary. So the plenary is at 16.30 and um, I'm happy that Tom Hengel will also join us for the plenary. Um, so um, we'll also include a short closing session. Um, who is planning to go to Veronica's session on space-time analysis in GIS? Two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, okay, very good. Who is willing to report on that session in the plenary briefly? Anyone has, somebody has to report? Yes, good, cool, thank you, great. Who is going to Michael Sumner's creating our packages session? Yeah, that is not, that will not lead to capacity problems. Who is willing to report on that session? Should be too hard, we will not ask you to, to create a package in front of everyone, right? <laughs> Who will do a very brief report on, on that uh, session of Mike Sumner? Cool, thank you, great. Uh, and who is going to my session on time with space simple features? Okay, cool, great. Who is willing to report on that one? Thank you, André. Um, then we have the afternoon program. Who is going to Anita Graser's session? Well, if one, only one person is going, then... <laughs> Robin, yes? Okay, then it's a 50% draw, right? <laughs> Henning, will you report on that one? Good, cool. Uh, who is going to Judith Verstegen's session on dynamic modeling? Okay. Yes. Are you also reporting on that? Yeah. Good. And who is going to the OpenEO session? 
There's a few more hands. And we, who is going to report on that? Who is willing to report on that? Will you? <laughs> cool. <laughs> Great. Okay. Veronica is going to. Um, so in this sort of, uh, I'm, I'm not entirely sure whether everyone who's on the summer school is, is right in this room, and I also don't have the impression that all the hands that I saw were all the hands of the people here. So I hope that everyone knows where she or he is going to. Um, and I sort of looking at hands, I th don't think there will be uh, capacity problems. Uh, one room change is that yesterday I went to room 401 and I couldn't work out how the Beamer worked with my computer. So I'm going to move my morning session to room 201. Yes, like we did, like we did yesterday. So 401 will become 201. So if you think 401 and you are there and nobody's there, then two floors down, same spot. Yeah. Um, okay, great. That means it is 10:29 at my clock, and we have one minute to. What do we do, Christian? Yeah. Here's the microphone. Yeah, I just want to make one organizational announcement. Um, some of you have already asked us about certificates or invoices for the summer school. Um, Tom has now prepared some um, that include the most essential information about the summer school and the fees you've paid. And I've printed them and um, put them up there next to the um, exit of the lecture hall. Uh, we are aware that all your different institutions or funding organizations have their own requirements regarding these um, certificates. So if the ones we've prepared are not correct or sufficient for you, just send a message to Tom specifying what information you exactly need in those um, certificates and then he'll prepare one for you. That's basically it. Okay, then it's now, do we do the time, do we, we do the picture outside? Yeah. yeah. Okay, then it's now time for the group picture. We'll do that outside just before the coffee break, right now, in like 30 seconds. <laughs> 